I want to ask you how you frame the choice that you and other MPs are going to have to make tomorrow. Do you frame this as a choice between a deal and no deal? Or you, do you frame this as a choice between a deal and an extension? I think it is definitely between a deal and an extension. Uh, the Prime Minister, the UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson, talks about getting Brexit done. But with his proposals, the only thing that will get done is the British people. The British people will be done over by his set of proposals, which, according to the UK government's own economic impact assessments, will lead to a 6.4% drop in real wages, a 6.7% drop in GDP. And just to put that into context for your viewers, that is not dissimilar from the negative economic impact of the global financial crash. Another important thing to note, by the way, Anna, you talked about a deal. This isn't a deal. It is a withdrawal agreement that deals with the divorce bill of £39 billion or so, EU and UK citizens' rights to move around each other's territories. It tries to move towards resolving the Irish border issue, but what it importantly does not include is a legally binding trade deal. That will be negotiated in the years that follow. So investors, market makers watching this programme who think that that this withdrawal agreement the Prime Minister has put down will create certainty, actually we're going to continue to see a good form, few more years of uncertainty continuing. And the only way to really stop that is by stopping Brexit, which is what the Liberal Democrats are proposing. Right, but he has, but Boris Johnson and, uh, and team have, uh, to get this over the line, had to commit to uh, sticking to some EU rules around state aid, competition, employment standards, environment, relevant tax matters. Now, that does seem to be just in the uh, political declaration rather than the withdrawal agreement, but perhaps he is setting that path in a direction that you hadn't expected. No, because don't forget the transition agreement um, where these kind of it's described as a standstill. So just for a short period after withdrawal agreement, the UK would abide by EU rules in the main. That will only be until the end of next year. And that's the thing is all this really does is extend the gangplank. But it's a gangplank to nowhere because at the moment, after December 2020, there is no trade deal. So we could be we will be if we're in that situation faced with the same scenario that we are are now in. So all the reasons why people are putting off investment decisions or indeed making investment decisions based on UK not having a trade agreement with the EU, all of that is just going to happen again this time next year. So it really doesn't solve anything whatsoever about the future of the UK economy. And all of that, Anna, comes down to the fact that the promises that were made to the British people by Boris Johnson when he headed the Vote Leave campaign have been impossible to square with reality. You know, the core of what he sold to the British people was that you can have all the economic benefits of EU membership without having to pay the subscription fee or abide by the rules. And time has shown that that was absolute fantasy and has been impossible to deliver. And that's why you've had the political chaos and disruption in the UK ever since. OK, and we'll see what kind of uh, free trade agreement then the negotiations throw up if we get that far, as you say. Uh, let me ask you about the weekend, though, the nearer term events, uh, and if any of the amendments are going to be something we need to keep an eye on then for international investors, maybe uh, wanting to focus in on the important stuff tomorrow. Check out. In particular, there's a Oliver Letwin amendment I see that uh, might be around allowing an extension to give further scrutiny to the documentation. What, what are you hearing around the amendments and what we need to watch? Well, the focus for members of parliament who sit on the Remain side of the argument, as I do, will be on defeating the withdrawal agreement tomorrow uh, and ensuring that parliament can scrutinise what happens going forward. And of course, as you allude to, ensuring that the extension uh, that the Prime Minister will be legally bound to request of the um, EU Council, the letter requesting that extension goes in. It, uh, one thing I would say to investors and people watching that is not to believe the spin and the press statements that are put out by Number 10 Downing Street. The Prime Minister has a record in being economical with the truth, and that's a generous interpretation. But the thing to pay attention to are the documents um, that the government submitted to the Scottish Court of Session the week before last when they said um, in and gave undertakings that they would send that letter requesting an extension if the withdrawal agreement wasn't, wasn't passed by the House of Commons this weekend. And of course, if 
um, having made those undertakings to the Scottish court, the Prime Minister were not to request an extension, and then he would be in contempt of court, which is akin to a criminal offence. So I think we can say, we can be fairly certain that if the withdrawal agreement isn't passed by the House of Commons on Saturday, then that letter will be going because I don't believe that the Prime Minister will want to commit a criminal offence, although you know he has a habit of breaking the law. Well, and, and we'll see if it doesn't pass, and if that if, the, if it doesn't pass in the Commons, then uh, I understand that Mark Field MP, who has been sitting in a constituency um, uh, around the City of London, of course, he's going to be stepping down. This, I think, is the seat that you want to contest, Chuka. Does this uh, increase your chances? How do you rate your chances at any uh, future general election? Well, look, we're confident that we can take the seat, um, but we're not complacent. The cities of London and Westminster that I'm actually sitting in right now, and as you're right, I'm the parliamentary candidate for the Liberal Democrats here, as well as our shadow foreign secretary. It's a seat that overwhelmingly voted to remain in the European Union, which is not surprising. It, it contains Europe's financial services centre, the city, and the West End, which has leading creative industries, not just in Europe, but around the world in it. And for all of those sectors and industries, it will do a immense damage to their prospects and that's why residents, people who live here, think it would be a terrible thing for our country to leave the European Union and currently they are represented in Parliament by a right-wing conservative nationalist um, government in the Vote Leave government led by Boris Johnson and what we found on the doorstep here is that the traditional support that there had been over the decades for the Conservatives here is collapsing. So many of those people are flocking to the Liberal Democrats. And a lot of Labour um, voters are coming to the Liberal Democrats too because they recognise that the best way of defeating the Conservatives in this um, constituency, this parliamentary constituency, which is not just a national symbol for the UK but an international symbol for those Liberal internationalist open values, they recognise the best way of getting rid of the Conservatives is by voting for the Liberal Democrats. So we're, we're confident we can win it. but we're we're fighting for every single vote. Nobody, um, you know, you have to earn the support, and that's what we're seeking to do between now and the general election, which I think many people believe will come before Christmas because Boris Johnson here in the UK is, is running a minority administration. He has a majority of minus 45 in that sense and, and cannot currently govern.